Well, indeed. I'm here. The title of my talk is Who Pulled the Stake Out? And I'm here to talk about the resurgence of young earth creationism, a movement that we thought, ideally, uh, was already dead and gone. But in fact, creation science is still around. And remember creation science? Um, uh, Henry Morris, the Institute for Creation Research, the Creation Research Society, um, Answers in Genesis with Ken Ham, the, uh, the Australian branch, shall we say, of the creationism uh, movement, inspired by American young earth creationists like Henry Morris, but now come back to the United States to missionize us. And, of course, perhaps the most recent uh, uh, creationist to come upon the national scene and, and gain a certain amount of uh, notoriety with his organization, Christian Science Evangelism, a few months ago when uh, there, was a, there was a federal district court trial because he decided that as a minister he didn't have to bother paying Social Security and withholding on his employees, and so he's now spending some time in the federal penitentiary. <laughs> But the young earth creationists are the folks who brought you the truly zany science of young earth creationism based upon the biblical doctrine of special creation in which God created all the creatures on the earth, plants and animals and humans, specially in their present form and all at one time. So dinosaurs and human beings and all the mammals and pteranodons and and uh, pine trees and uh, bryophytes and everything was created all at one time as we see them today. That's the doctrine of special creation. So if this is your belief, then you expect that the fossil record, the geological column, that the evidence of science is going to reflect this. So especially interesting in young earth creationism is of course the young earth component in which they believe that all of this occurred within thousands of years, um, six to ten thousand years. Some of the more radical creationists will go all the way up to fourteen or fifteen thousand, but those are really the fringe creationists. <laughs> um, uh, they're the ones who take the bristlecone pine uh, uh, dates seriously, but they're considered kind of off there in the ozone someplace. But one of the enthusiasms of uh, young earth creationists movement is to try to demonstrate that dinosaurs and humans live together at the same time because obviously this would destroy evolution as we know. Uh, it would be really tough for evolution to, dis to explain how it is that dinosaurs and humans coexisted. So one of their enthusiasms is finding evidence for human and dinosaur remains in the same strata like these Paluxy River, Texas uh, man tracks, as they call them, human footprints. Now, some of these are obviously carvings. This is a good example of something that is truly a carving. You would not mistake this for a genuine human footprint, the footprints in stone. Um, but most of the footprints, even that aren't obvious carvings, she says, hoping that the computer works again. There we go. Even the ones that are not obvious carvings, even the ones that look kind of, um, you know, lozenge-shaped and uh, are, you know, maybe this is something funny. Notice the scale on this. This is about three feet long. <laughs> and uh, they, it also happens to be at about the same depth as the dinosaur tracks. Uh, but this is not a problem because in those days there were giants in the earth. <laughs> There are, however, real dinosaur footprints down there in Glen Rose, Texas, in the Cretaceous limestones, and they are quite abundant. And uh, there are occasional scour marks or eroded dinosaur tracks that people have called man tracks for years, but these have been analyzed, and there really is no there there, so you don't really have to worry about human and dinosaur tracks uh, coexisting in the same geological strata. Perhaps one of the most uh, fascinating aspects of young earth creationism is flood geology. Uh, they believe that Noah's flood explains all of the sedimentary deposits on the planet, including the deepest portions of the planet, like uh, Grand Canyon, uh, to beat sandstone, all of those separate individual layers laid down by Noah's flood. And the highest mountains as well are a result of Noah's flood. Needless to say, this is a little tough to do scientifically. But that is the claim because this is creation science. This is the effort to take a biblical literalist view of how things came to be as we see them today and claim that there is scientific evidence and data for it. As you've read on Pastor Deacon's Fred website, the uh, creation scientists have been um, very assiduous in, in 
presenting um, really bad science to prove that. And this is supposedly the resting place of Noah's Ark in Turkey, uh, which was promoted by a number of creation scientists as being um, evidence for uh, Noah's flood. And it is a very interesting shape, and it's about the 300 cubits long, etc., that the biblical dimensions call for. Unfortunately, from a geological standpoint, it's something called a syncline, which if you are a geologist, you will recognize fairly quickly. The claims of the creation scientists, of course, are really dreadful science. But it's not the science that really makes them successful as a popular movement. Uh, it is more their presentation of ideas that many members of the public um, um, seize upon as being believable and, um, and which uh, are, are readily absorbed. How many of you have seen the uh, Big Daddy tracks? Right, good old Big Daddy, Jack T. Chick. Well, one of the most famous uh, Chick pamphlets is this little booklet called Big Daddy, which um, many of you have seen. It involves a, um, a dogmatic professor who uh, is completely intolerant of the uh, young Christian who appears in his class to challenge evolution. After a while, he finds that this young Christian is really coming up with really solid science that is shaking the confidence of the other students in the classroom about the, the validity of the scientific theory of evolution. Uh, and eventually, of course, this young man uh, who is really quite pink-cheeked and, and uh, well-groomed, uh, as opposed to the rather shabby-looking professor, uh, he does prevail and, and brings everyone to, um, to his religious point of view. So, you know, one, one thing about, about creation science comic books that's always just astonished me, I mean, I, what were they thinking? These are the only comic books on the planet that have footnotes. <laughs> he is destroying me. Vestigial or vestigial, little asterisk, vestigial, a shrunken part of the body that is no longer. You know, they'll have footnotes to articles in science. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just a scream in many respects. Well, creation science had kind of a bad patch in the early 1980s. In the late 80s and early Start again, Jeannie. Just washed my tongue, can't do a thing with it. Um, in the late 70s and early 80s, there were a lot of attempts in the United States to pass legis legislation requiring that if you teach evolution, you have to teach creation science to balance it out. Uh, balance is a big deal, speaking of rhetoric. And uh, we counted 23 states that had such legislation um, uh, submitted. The good news is the vast majority of these uh, legislative pieces died in, uh, in, in committee, not on their own. I mean, it's because scientists and teachers and civil libertarians showed up to say, we don't want this, and persuaded the decision makers to vote against these bills. But Arkansas and Louisiana passed these measures, and there was a full trial in the state of Arkansas over Arkansas 590, the equal time bill that was passed there in 1981, and it was a marvelous experience. I'm going to talk briefly about the Dover, well, a little more actually about the Dover trial. But the McLean versus Arkansas trial, in many respects, um, presaged an awful lot of what we saw a couple of years ago in Kitzmiller versus Dover. In fact, when we were working on Kitzmiller, we kept having these McLean flashbacks because so many parallels were, were, were extant. And one of these days, I really have to write an article on that because it's a lot of fun. But what happened was there were a series of um, scientific experts for the plaintiffs, which is, from our standpoint, the good guy side. Uh, the plaintiffs were the ones who brought the case against the creationist bill. Um, National Academy of Science members, extremely prominent scientists uh, for the plaintiffs' witnesses. There were a group of individuals um, who were defense witnesses, um, scientists, but nobody had really heard of most of them except for an Englishman named Chandra Wickwama Singh who turned out to be a real liability for the uh, uh, defense because under cross-examination he admitted that anybody who thought the earth was only a few thousand years old uh, must, it, this, this was rubbish, simply rubbish, he said on the stand, which wasn't really good for the defense. Um, 